Yes, that was a very, very good talk. Thank you. Um, the topic of our next presentation is intriguing, if I can read the small print here. From acid soil fields to the lab and back. So I won't take up too much of your time. I will introduce Dr. Lian Kochen. He is from the um, USDA Research Service, Robert W. Hawley Center for Agriculture and Health on the Cornell University campus. And he will give a presentation with Dr. Durandia Magalias. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Durandia Magalias is a research scientist working uh, since 2002 for the maize and sorghum unit of the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation in Embrapa, that's in Brazil. Thank you. Uh, th join me in welcoming Dr. Kocha. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, uh, Felicitas. And as Felicitas mentioned earlier, we have a joint talk with my colleague and collaborator speaking after me, Dr. Malgi Ice. So I'm asking you can reserve uh, questions till after his, his talk. Um, so I'm, we're going to be talking today about a project we've worked on for a number of years. It's part of a, um, a, a broader project where looking at, what did I do? Okay. The button on the back shuts it off. <laughs> I'm just trying to turn my timer on, which I can barely see. So it's part of a broader program on cereal adaptation to marginal soils. But a lot of our work focuses on acid soils. And I'll explain why in a moment. And this particular project um, is why it's, it's probably the most advanced in terms of looking at sorghum aluminum tolerance on acid soils, uh, where we've we are translating our, our functional genomics and molecular genetic work to the field in developing countries. So why are, we, are people interested, and a lot of labs are interested in acid soils? Well, if you look at a soil map of acid soils, of, of soil pH worldwide, the red are the highly acid soils from pH 5 and below. And you can see they're very extensive. It's estimated about 40% of the world's potentially arable lands are highly acidic. But I particularly want to direct your attention to the humid tropics and subtropics, uh, which are all very highly acidic. Often pH, soil pH is around four, where many of the developing countries reside. And also I want to point out, yes, here's Brazil. I got it right. And it's almost all acid soils. And that's why Geringer and Embrapa maize and sorghum works on this problem. Um, on these acid soils, aluminum, which is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust, significant component of clays, which are aluminosilicate, it's solubilized into a, a soluble species. The trivalent cation Al3 plus dominates in the pH 4 to 5 range, and that's very toxic to roots. It in, interacts with the growing root apex and significantly inhibits root growth. As you can see here with these sensitive and tolerant near isogenic lines of wheat at pH 4.4, you get almost no root growth in the sensitive line. So not surprisingly, significant yield loss due to drought and nutrient deficiencies under aluminum toxicity. And aluminum toxicity in acid soils, it's probably the second most widespread limitation, abiotic limitation to agriculture uh, next to drought. And also on acid soils, the crops need to have all those traits for drought tolerance and avoidance, but they also have to be aluminum tolerant on the acid soils. Otherwise, you don't have the roots to take up water. The field of aluminum tolerance in crops, we've identified a number of mechanisms of both aluminum avoidance and aluminum tolerance. For sorghum, the major mechanism is the best studied mechanism, which is aluminum exclusion from the root apex, the growing root apex. And it's based on aluminum activation of organic acid release. So here would be the plasma membrane of a, a root epidermal outer cortical cell in the root tip. These yellow bits would be specialized transporters. The AL3 plus in the rhizosphere activates these transporters. And either the ALMTs would, would allow malate anion to flow out into the rhizosphere, and the mate transporters allow citrate, 
which both very effectively chelate AL3 plus and keep it out of the growing root and allow the root to continue growing through that aluminum toxic soil. One, one slide on the genetics, very simple slide on the genetics of aluminum tolerance. It's a, a relatively simple trait genetically in sorghum and also wheat and barley, where a single gene can explain a lot of the variation in a particular biparental mapping population. It's a more complex quantitative trait in maize and rice, and in particularly in rice, where I collaborate with Susan McCooch, who's in the audience, where it looks like rice pyramids, a number of genes and a number of tolerance mechanisms. And in sorghum, as well as wheat, barley, and maize, this aluminum-activated organic acid release is the major mechanism of aluminum tolerance, aluminum avoidance. So it's not surprising that the first two aluminum tolerance genes that were cloned were organic acid transporters. The first one in wheat, ALMT, for aluminum-activated malate efflux transporter. And then our labs, uh, and I'll be talking about this for the rest of the talk, we cloned a mate, a citrate transporter. Mates are members of the multi-drug and toxic compound extrusion family of membrane transporters. So this one that we, in sorghum, we call SB mate. So I'm going to talk a bit, again, about the background on the, the cloning of SB mate, the primary sorghum aluminum tolerance gene. So this work began when Geringer came from Embrapa maize and sorghum to my lab to do his PhD. Not much was known about the genetics of aluminum tolerance. Bob Schaffert's a wonderful sorghum breeder, and he had generated a number of different really fine genetic resources, both real populations, F2 populations near isogenic lines. So Zuringer started out by phenotyping a mapping population across between an aluminum sensitive standard and an aluminum tolerant standard. And I got to mention a little bit about phenotyping. Again, for mapping and map-based cloning, particularly of root traits, phenotyping is really important. Jura was a master at it. For this trait, aluminum tolerance is root growth in, in an aluminum-containing solution uh, divided by root growth in the control solution, so relative root growth. So if you have 100% relative root growth, you have no inhibition by aluminum. So you looked at the, the segregation of relative root growth in this mapping population. And it's segregated in a way that explained inheritance by a segregation of a single major semi-dominant locus that we called Alt-SB for aluminum tolerance and sorghum, uh, sorghum bicolor. So Jura went on to do more detailed mapping. He, when he, by the time he had completed his PhD, I think he had mapped it to the top of to, to a particular linkage group, and then working with Trish Klein at Texas A&M, they had physically mapped it to the top of chromosome 3. Jura then went back to Embrapa to, to start running his own lab, and we've been collaborating ever since. And this positional cloning of SB mate was, it's been led by Jura, along with a lot of these other projects we'll be talking about. It's been a great collaboration. I can ride on his coattails. Um, and this ended up being the first map-based cloning of any gene in sorghum. And in my lab, Ji Ping Liu, a really good molecular biologist, did a significant part of the molecular characterizations. So the high-resolution map came from phenotyping about 2100 F2s. And it got down to the resolution. These red arrows are the flanking markers that flank um, the Alt-SB locus. It's about a 25 KB region. And within that region, there are three ORFs. ORF 7, 8, and 9. It turned out ORFs 8 and 9, just doing RT-PCR, are only expressed in the shoot. They're not even expressed in the root. They have to be expressed in the root tip to be involved in aluminum tolerance. The third one, the mate, we looked at in more detail. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the physiology of sorghum aluminum tolerance. And this was some data obtained from Veda Alves, who was the director of Embrapa Maze and Sorghum at the time, and she was on sabbatical in my lab, working with my longtime lab manager, John Schaff. So on this left side, we're measuring not relative root growth, but daily root growth rate of roots of an aluminum tolerant nil and an aluminum sensitive nil that just differ at the alt SB locus in the absence and presence of aluminum. And you can see this over a six-day period. You can see the sensitive nil, the roots are really hammered. And by about four days, there's no root growth. And interestingly, the tolerant 
mill is not very tolerant the first few days. You've got about 50, 60 percent inhibition. By about day three, the daily root growth rate is increasing in aluminum, this yellow squares. And by about days four, five, or six, you have no inhibition of root growth. So the tolerance is inducible, and it takes four to six days. On the right side, we have citrate release from the same lines over the same time period in the absence white and the presence yellow of uh, aluminum. And you can see the tolerant lines have much more aluminum activated citrate release than the sensitive lines. <clears throat> and what you can see is that the citrate release is also inducible. It maximizes at about six days in aluminum. So let's look at QRT-PCR results of SB-made expression in the same sensitive and tolerant near isogenic lines just in the root tip. That's the only place it's expressed um, in one three or six days without or with aluminum. So first thing you can see is SB-made expression only occurs in the root tip of the tolerant line. After one day in aluminum, when they're not very tolerant, you do have this large constitutive expression. And that's not really associated with aluminum tolerance. What is is this incremental increase in expression under aluminum that takes about six days to fully express. And that coincides nicely with that induction in the rate of citrate release in the induction, full induction of aluminum tolerance. So a final slide, you know, as a molecular physiologist, rarely prove anything. Um, we make circumstantial cases, kind of like district attorneys. Um, and, and here's our circumstantial case, very strong one, that SP mate is the major sorghum aluminum tolerance gene. It was the only gene between those flanking markers ma marking the locus that was expressed in the roots, and specifically the root tip, where it has to be expressed for tolerance. Much higher expression in the root tips of the tolerant lines. We see this repeatedly. The aluminum induces expression, and the time-dependent kinetics of aluminum induction are very similar to the kinetics of aluminum induction of tolerance and citrate release. And finally, we've expressed espumate in several different transgenic both model and crop species and see significant increase in aluminum tolerance and citrate release from the root. So now I'm going to talk about some relatively new work and a general theme that SB mate can't do at all. And even though it's the major aluminum tolerance gene in sorghum, when we delve deeper, it's more complex. And Jura will be talking more about this in detail. I'm going to talk about a particular accessory protein gene that we kind of stumbled across in my lab and working with Geringer. So as I said before, the Alt-SB locus explains most of the variation in any particular biparental mapping population. Despite this, work from Geringer's lab is showing that there are accessory aluminum tolerance genes whose variation also make a significant contribution to SB mate. So there are tolerant alleles of SB mate and tolerant alleles of these other genes. So this makes the molecular breeding for improved aluminum tolerance using SP mate a little more complicated, kind of have a molecular toolbox. And I'm going to talk about one of these accessory genes and proteins that was discovered by Ji Ping Liu in my lab. So the start for this is when, remember, in sorghum roots, you need aluminum to induce SP mate expression, but you need it to activate also the citrate transport by the SP mate protein. So but when we express SB mate in heterologous systems, either frog eggs, xenopus oocytes, or yeast, we see a large constitutive citrate release independent of aluminum. In fact, aluminum in oocytes inhibits the citrate release. So there's they, so, and that's shown here. This is some nice electrophysiology by a prominent member of our team and Mark Tester's first PhD student many years ago, Miguel Pinaros. He's a brilliant molecular electrophysiologist. And so he makes cRNA to SB mate, microinjects it into a frog egg. If you're lucky, it, tr it translates it into the properly folded protein. And if you're lucky, it gets into the proper membrane, in this case, the plasma membrane. Then you can stick two electrodes in these big cells and do two electrode voltage clamp. Not going to go into the details of electrophysiology, just to show you at pH 4.5. Water injected oocytes don't have any transport. The SB made injected oocytes, as we clamp the membrane potential at increasing negative voltage, we see this nice anion current. Remember, the citrate is an anion flowing out of the cell that he validated 
by injecting C14 labeled citrate into the cells that SB-MADE is transporting citrate out. Here is, is SB-MADE expressing oocytes versus water injected oocytes. So SB-MADE has the same general transport permeation properties in that it transports citrate, as we see in roots, but the citrate efflux in these heterologous systems is not um, activated or enhanced by aluminum exposure. So that suggests there's another protein in sorghum needed to activate the SB mate in an aluminum dependent manner. So what Ji Ping did is was one of the early uses of the split ubiquitin yeast 2 hybrid system to use with membrane proteins. Again, SB mate's a plasma membrane protein. He identified an SB mate interacting protein, and it's from a family of of proteins, membrane proteins that bind di and trivalent cations. That made us think maybe an aluminum binding protein. So we haven't published yet, so I'm calling it MBP for metal binding protein or SBMBP. So we validated the yeast to hybrid work both with in vitro and in vivo assays. Here is an in vitro pull down assay where we used in vitro translation to make radio labeled SB mate. And we also made radio labeled leucylphorase as a negative control. And then we made an affinity column where the metal binding protein was uh, a, 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 attached to the column. We ran the late radio labeled proteins through, and only the SB mate binds to the SB MBP, again, verifying in vitro that the two proteins bind. And then in vivo, we used BIFC, so with SB mate and, and SB MBP. And if they interact, you should get the yellow fluorescence of reconstituted YFP. And we did see that both. It's a little hard to see in these bright lights in sorghum protoplasts at the plasma membrane and in transient expression in tobacco leaves uh, um, at the epidermis. Ji Ping also showed that this protein is an aluminum binding protein. So he made, he had NTA resin column loaded with aluminum and ran the radioactive MBP through it. It only bound to the NTA if it had aluminum in it, pH 4.3, which is AL3+. So that showed us it's an aluminum binding protein. He then did differential calorimetry to say it, show it prefers to bind AL3+, compared to other tri and divalent cations as a KM of a couple micromolar. So now, from now on, I'll call it ALBP for aluminum binding protein. So here's a functional reconstitution study in yeast. This is citrate exudation in yeast alone in the absence green and the presence of aluminum blue. Yeast don't have the mates, don't have any citrate release. If you just express SB made in yeast, just like in oocytes, you get this huge constitutive citrate release independent of aluminum. However, if you express SB made and ALBP together, you reconstitute what you see in roots. Not much citrate release in the absence of aluminum and about a five-fold increase in the presence of aluminum. Now, you, I'm sure I know what you're thinking because I thought it at first. Okay, but look at all that citrate release. That's got to be more aluminum tolerant than when you, re, when you express both of the, of the genes. So let's look at the aluminum tolerance of these three genotypes. Relative yeast growth in, in, in response to increasing aluminum. Here's the wild type. Very sensitive, inhibited, about 80% by 20, 25 micromolar aluminum. Here's the SB made expressing huge citrate exuding line. Yes, it's quite a bit more aluminum tolerant. But look at this. The one expressing both SB made and ALBP is quite a bit more aluminum tolerant. And the reason is this line is wasting carbon. It grows much slower than these other two lines in the absence of aluminum. It's using too much of its carbon in citrate, and you're getting essentially a yield decrease. So this, our model for this is that it's important for carbon efficient release of citrate. This is a movie that, uh, don't click yet. <laughs> so here we have our BIFC of the SB made and AOBP bound together at the plasma membrane. We now infiltrate aluminum into the tobacco cell because they're, they're hollow and it takes a while for that AL3 plus to diffuse through the negative cell wall. Go ahead and click on the movie now. And you'll see that it takes a little while for the aluminum to get in there, but you see the, the, you lose the fluorescence because the two proteins come apart. This is not due to, I'm not going to show all the controls, to bleaching or to degradation of the proteins. We, it, it's consistent with them coming apart in vivo. So here's our working model. SBALBP is an aluminum sensor. 
that's an SB mate negative regulator. It's a membrane protein. And when you have SB mate in the plasma membrane, it's recruited, ALBP is recruited to the plasma membrane. Without aluminum, it binds to SB mate and blocks citrate permeation. In the presence of aluminum, the, it comes in, we think through the transporter, binds to ALBP, has a, a conformational change, dissociates, and allows citrate release. So this helps the sorghum plant conserve carbon because this is a valuable carbon currency to the plant. And acid soils are quite variable. They're not uniformly aluminum toxic. They can go from pH 4 to pH 6 in 5, 6, 8 centimeters. So you only want the root releasing citrate when you have toxic amounts of, of uh, aluminum around. Just the last couple of slides. So, you know, Juringer is going to be talking about superior alleles of SB mate. Well, he's done association analysis on SBALBP, and he's identified polymorphism SNPs in the third exon and in the three prime UTR that strongly associate with aluminum tolerance and explain about 3% of the variation. So like SB mate, it looks like there are superior ALBP alleles that could be contributing to our molecular toolbox. So last slide. Although SB mate explains a large fraction of the variation for aluminum tolerance in mapping populations, we have identified actually several azure will talk accessory aluminum tolerance genes. And here we say we know that SB mate can't do it all. It needs the function of this properly set up aluminum binding protein to regulate its function in the proper way. Okay, this ensures that only the citrate release only occurs under, uh, uh, under aluminum toxic conditions. Okay, well, thanks a lot, and I'm going to hand this over to Jura.